I'd like everybody to give a warm hand to Dr. Elizabeth Cornwell. Good afternoon. Everyone hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, one, thank you for welcoming, <coughs> welcoming me here today and the groups, of course, Flash, who I've worked with now, and CFI. Um, I go back with them a long time, and, and the wonderful James Randy, um, James Randy Educational Foundation, and James Randy himself. And this is the first time I've been at Broward College, so thank you for the invite. It's, um, it's nice to celebrate Darwin Day and Lincoln's birthday, I think, too. Uh, friends. So I'm going to talk a little bit about evolution and then talk a little bit of more on how it affects humans. And um, so because this is a bit of a mixed audience, I'm going to go over a few things that some of you may know very well, but others may not know quite as well, so be patient. And hopefully I'll give you some new ideas as well of how to explain to people who really don't understand some of the very basic concepts of evolution and natural selection which I find even people take, who take accept evolutionary theory don't always understand its nuances. And the nuances are what are really fun. So, of course, this is a famous quote by Dobzhensky, why evolution matters. Because nothing in biology makes sense except in the line of evolution. And this is absolutely true. And as an educator, and I understand there are many people here who are involved in education, especially of young people, and it's so nice to see young people here. Denying young people one of the most basic, basic tenet of knowledge, how evolution works, how every living organism around us came to be, to deny that, to me, orders on criminal. It's a terrible terrible crime to keep people from understanding the beauty of life. And as an evolutionary psychologist, one of the things that brought me into evolutionary psychology was the fact that it confirmed this idea that we are all cousins. We are all so closely united with every living thing on this planet. And that's really an uplifting way of looking at it. So, even though most people will accept, or many, many, many people, I'll say most, I'll be an optimist, most people will accept the basic tenets of evolutionary theory, when it comes to human evolution, there seems to be a bit of a problem. People don't necessarily like the idea of human evolution once it starts getting into present-day humans. In fact, I'm not only disliked by very conservative, religious right, I'm also disliked by the liberals because they don't particularly like the idea of talking about human differences. And they don't like the idea of talking about us as, as being animals, as being apes. But that's what we are. We're a very unique ape, but then so are bonobos. Very unique apes. So are gorillas. Very unique. We're just one type of unique ape. So this is, you know, all of you have seen this, is the type of evolutionary tree that we see when we look at hominids. And when we think about the skulls and the shapes, we tend to accept that. But, we'll, but then when we start talking about, you know, we have these physical tra traits. So we have a figure of a human, we have ancestors, some fossilized primates, and everyone can say, oh yeah, that, we can see the similarities. How can you even deny the fact that these are our ancestors? Very clear. No issues. And even without the fossil record, as wonderful it is, as it is to have the fossil record to be able to hold up rocks and skulls and skeletons, um, with what we know now about DNA, we would not even need the fossil record to, uh, to have the evidence we need for evolutionary process. DNA is unlocking so much more than the fossil record really can. And it's a wonderful, again, the evidence for evolution and natural selection is overwhelming. And the unraveling of DNA is truly a crowning point in human history. But despite all this evidence, as I mentioned, 
there is a resistance to human behavior, and that it is indeed something that evolved along with our skeletal structures that everybody can recognize and say, oh yes, I have hands somewhat like a chimpanzee. And this split came early on in the history of evolutionary thought. Wallace and Darwin disagreed on these essential points. Wallace never took the position that human higher uh, faculties could have been explained by natural selection. He accepted concepts of spiritualism, and he, ex and he thought that was the only way we could explain human intelligence and moral behavior. Darwin never wavered from his view that human behavior, all aspects of human behavior, were a product of natural selection. Emotions, consciousness, or intelligence, everything was due to the processes that also evolved kangaroos and the way they hop, the way snakes go after their prey. Humans have a unique niche in this world. So this argument continues today, and it's, it's one that the religious right also uses a lot. Well, how can people evolve morality? We'll accept that it's an old universe. We'll accept that evolution started. But at some point in time, there was this divine spark that turned from a hominid ancestor like Lucy into who we are now. The other thing that Darwin and Wallace disagreed on was on individual and group selection. And just a very brief note for those who haven't had a strong exposure to evolutionary theory. And this again is, a, is something that is going on within evolutionary psychology. Uh, is, is it group selection or is it individual selection? Again, Darwin thought it was individual selection. Um, how many here have read The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins? Okay, good. More of you, please, <laughs> read it. It's a wonderful book and it really does highlight how individual selection works. Group selection is what some psychologists, some um, anthropologists use to try to explain the morality, religion, and group behavior in humans. So again, that's just an argument to know that exists, but it doesn't change the fact that evolution is true. Then we come to sexual selection. This was another contention between Darwin and Wallace. Wallace felt that if there were any type of sexual selection, that it would be minor, that it would have very, very little influence. Darwin, on the other hand, felt that sexual selection was probably one of the most critical parts of the evolutionary process. I'm going to touch on natural selection and sexual selection. And I want to make it clear from the, from the get-go, the two are not necessarily sitting side by side. There's a lot of overlap, and it's sometimes sort of difficult to say, oh, you can't just say, well, this is natural selection, this is sexual selection. So, but in this talk, I'm going to be talking more broad terms, so I just don't want you to get the impression that I'm trying to put them into two different camps, because that's not how it works. So, just as a refresher course, natural selection, the three major parts, um, there is variance, as you see with these puppies, all from the same litter, there's variance. Inheritance, so some inherited genes for more white, some for more black. And then there's selection. In this case, we're talking about artificial selection, where the dog breeder will pick which dog he wants to have to continue on in the breeding pool, and the other dogs will um, be fixed and they won't continue to breed. And of course, Darwin used artificial selection to make his case for natural selection. Simply, it was nature and the environment that does the selecting, that, as um, Dr. Merrick said, you know, causes this seed, this bottlenecking sometimes, and allows for speciation to happen. 